Hello and welcome to If You Love This Planet. My special guest today is Vladimir Wurtelecki, the founder and chairman of the Department of Medical Genetics and Birth Defects Center of the University of South Alabama in the USA. Prior to his training in medical genetics at Harvard University Medical School, he trained in pediatrics at St. Louis Children's Hospital, Washington University. Dr. Wurtelecki is a diplomat of the American Board of Pediatrics and member of the Academy of Pediatrics, and since 1994, he has served as Secretary Treasurer of the World Alliance for the Prevention of Birth Defects. Dr. Vladimir Wurtelecki, welcome to If You Love This Planet. Well, thank you very much. And I believe you and I trained at Children's Hospital Medical Center at Harvard, but we were not there at the same time. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. Yes. Well, I was fascinated by a recent paper that you had published in the Journal of Pediatrics called Malformations in a Chernobyl-Affected Area. And you are a teratologist, which means you examine birth defects and very little is known or discussed about what is happening in the area around Chernobyl post-accident. And if you would, would, I would like you to explain to this audience what you are seeing in this area amongst the babies that are being born there since the accident. Well, congenital malformations uh, are many and uh, have many causes. And there are two ways to approach the question uh, whether there is a connection between Chernobyl and congenital malformation. The usual way is for measurements of how much radiation uh, is there And the other way is to measure the other extreme, and that is, are there any consequences that could be due to radiation? The first approach of measuring radiation is expensive, and there are virtually no standards that are applicable to the unborn. Most standards of radiometry, which is the measurement of radiation, are based on adults. And it is well known that the unborn or the child is 10 to 20 times, if not more, sensitive to the same amount of radiation than an adult. So our resources and capacity was more attuned to measuring consequences. Therefore, we initiated a what's called population monitoring. That means every baby born is actively uh, explored whether there are or there are any developmental problems with that particular child. And since congenital malformations are many and they are relatively rare, our plan was to do so over a span of 10 years in order to be able to accumulate sufficient data. And this is what we did. And as we were doing this, within two, three years, it was obvious that the rates of spina bifida and other defects of the nervous system uh, were many folds greater than expected. And so we wrote the report and continued. And the next... uh, Two years or so later, we began to notice an excess of conjoined twins, or what people call Siamese twins. And these were born in one of five different provinces, so that around this particular province, there are very few of such births, while all of them are occurring in this narrower area. So we then (coughs) emphasized studies in that particular province. And as we went on, uh, we began to notice other nervous system problems, mainly a reduced head size, which is called microcephaly, 
And again, this disorder is very complicated, it has many causes, and one has to be extremely cautious not to uh, misinterpret such sort of data. So we continued uh, plodding along, and after completing 10 years of studies, we published a report. And in essence, what the report says is that there is an excess of the frequency of anomalies of the nervous system and, in addition, these conjoined twins uh, in not the whole province, but particularly in the northern half of this province. Now, this northern half happens to be a unique ecology niche. It is a region of swamps, of wetlands, of forests. And furthermore, they have, this area has been the habitat of a unique population that Ukraine recognizes as distinct, as an ethnic uh, different group. And they have been there since recorded history, and they live in very small villages, very isolated, and relying completely on wild foods and locally produced foods, all of which are radioactive. The soils in that particular area of Ukraine are so different that plants absorb about 20 times as much radioactivity as the same plant growing, let's say, 50 miles away, uh, where the soils are richer in humus and other minerals. <clears throat> so consequently, people living in this northern half are absorbing or what's called incorporating in their body much higher levels of radiation than, than let's say, people living somewhere else. So this was one of the triggers to report these findings. Now, of course, these congenital anomalies of the nervous system can be due to other factors. For instance, uh, spina bifida can be due to folic acid deficiency or bad diets or lack of micronutrients. So it is very difficult and complicated and expensive to tease out specific causes on the basis of what's called a epidemiology study. What we have done is a descriptive epidemiology study. Now, this cannot prove cause. It only can prove a difference between point A and point B. Now that we have done this, we have ideas exactly how to do follow-up studies oriented to study cause, because we already know how to focus our attention. We know which villages uh, uh, are of particular interest, which anomalies are of particular interest, and so on. So that's a long answer, and I will elaborate as you, okay. as you uh, indicate. Well, the other cause, of course, of microcephaly, as you point out in your article in Pediatrics, Dr. Wertelecki, is alcoholism um, in the mother. Yes. Well, we, you know, we established OmniNet in Ukraine, which is a consortium. It's an international not-for-profit consortium, probably one of the first registered in Ukraine. Ukraine has been essentially independent very few years. It had to invent a constitution, had to invent rules and laws and modus operandi. But be that as it may, um, we, that OmniNet is a partner of the International Initiative on Fetal Alcohol Syndrome. Consequently, six universities joined us in studies of alcohol. And these well-funded studies of alcohol, incidentally, and these very substantial, well-funded, very expert studies of alcohol consumption by pregnant women and the offspring they have definitively show that the use of alcohol 
for the exposure of the unborn to alcohol in this northern part of that particular province is not only not higher, it is actually statistically significant less frequent. Oh, that's interesting. So we, we can say with confidence that whatever the factors are, and we suspect radiation is a major one, alcohol does not explain this particular excess of neural system anomalies yes. in the northern part. Now, I have another question. I know that children are 10 to 20 times more vulnerable to the mutagenic effects of radiation than adults, but I have heard that fetuses in the first trimester are about a 1,000 times more vulnerable and sensitive. Is that so or not so, Dr. Wirtalecki? Well, those are, those are extrapolations from non-human studies and uh, tissue cultures. There is virtually no human-based uh, evidence in this regard. And uh, it's very difficult to obtain. The most, uh, I say, prudent approach is to essentially admit that we do not have answers for the questions of fetus embryo, virtually none. And that's why th this particular population is so interesting and so important, mm. because now we have a third generation of people exposed to radiation since their birth. Mm. Or since and, their conception. Uh, since before their conception. So in other words, women that were, um, let's say, 16 years old at the time of Chernobyl, mm. uh, they, uh, let's say, were impacted by radiation. And if their tissue mutated, then they could have breast cancer and other cancers. Mm. But in their abdomen, even if they were not pregnant, they had oocytes, and these oocytes underwent mutations as well. So when they became pregnant, let's say in 1999, and had a baby in the year 2000, the egg that produced that baby and the sperm that produced that baby were exposed as well. Yes. And the baby was exposed since conception, and so on and so on. Well, those babies now are teenagers, and they have babies on their own, and that's the third generation. And this is exactly what is needed to understand what we have no data about. There is no chance to obtain such data in populations that are mixed up. This is a unique population that lives within their own niche, and they marry each other, and they live there, and they don't go anywhere. So from my understanding, if the genes in the eggs and sperm are mutated or the chromosomes are, or are damaged, you will get trisomies like Down syndrome or you will get genetic diseases which may be uh, dominant in the first generation like achondroplasia, uh, achondroplastic dwarfs, or you will develop recessive mutations for cystic fibrosis and diabetes and many other such uh, genetic abnormalities which won't show up for generations. Whereas, on the other hand, I thought that what you are seeing here with the microcephaly, the conjoint twins, the teratomas, the spinal cord defects and the like, that's teratogenesis. In other words, damage to a genetically, chromosomally normal embryo or moral or, or fetus. Um, Correct. So therefore, there are two ways to look at this. Obviously, there will be genetic and chromosomal abnormalities passed on generation to generation because of damage to eggs and sperm. But what you're seeing specifically in describing in this paper, I thought, was actually teratogenesis or damage to a normal fetus. That's correct. Actually, you see, you're 100% correct. Radiation has three effects. One is like a burn. In other words, it's a direct physical impact. It raises temperatures. It, it makes, let's say, a cell bubble. The next impact is teratogenesis, and that is it impacts rapidly developing tissues as an external interference factor. And that's the most important one, and that's the one we have been studying. 
The third effect is delayed. In other words, the most common long-range uh, de defect that goes on before birth and after birth and e even in the next generation are particularly chromosome alterations. We need to have an, a balanced chromosome in order to produce balanced children. And that's the major long-term damage of radiation. If the chromosomes are in an egg or a sperm, you have a hereditary chromosome problem. Mm. If it is in a tissue, like the breast or, or the gut or whatever, you have a carcinoma of the breast or colon or whatever have you. So the whole spectrum is true. But what we have focused on are essentially teratogenic, that is, congenital malformations due to the interference of radiation with a normal development. Yes. So I'd like you to explain. I've, I've got a list of the abnormalities that you uh, describe in your paper. Uh, I'll Correct. just read them through. Conjoint twins, teratomas, microcephaly, neural t tube defects, anophthalmia, microphthalmia, disruption of blastogenesis, Encephalocele's, uh, ionocephaly, I don't know what that is, and anencephaly. Would you like, Dr. Wojtelecki, to explain, please, to the audience, um, as we're two pediatricians talking together using our medical terminology, what these, what these terminologies actually mean? Well, interference by a teratogen or, a, or an agent that produces malformations varies at, uh, based on the time of its impact. So when a child is conceived and, uh, and an egg is fertilized, for the first uh, 16 or so cell divisions, every, the machine works only on the mother's genome or uses the genes of the mother. Uh, the cell divides and divides and divides and divides, but doesn't grow in size. It, it, the sperm has to unfold and contribute the other half of the genes coming from the father before it becomes a true parasite, before it can start feeding itself and increasing in volume at extraordinary speed. The, num the universe from conception to birth in terms of cell division is infinitely larger than all the cell divisions from birth to death that follow. Mm. So really, the development of an embryo is explosive. Mm. Now, mm. there are two parts of the developmental sequence. One is before implantation. That is, before the egg reaches the uterus and is able to become essentially a cancerous-like tumor. In other words, it it sticks into the wall, it begins to disintegrate the wall, makes it bleed, it begins to eat that blood, it develops its own circulation, and so on and so on. These malformations we're talking about are essentially before implantation. Oh, really? Before a woman, before a woman even knows she's pregnant. Oh. So in other words, they are very early, and the first one, of course, is you lay, first of all, a line or an axis. This is going to be top or head. This is going to be tail or bottom. This is going to be right or left and front and back. And this is when you have one axis. Well, sometimes that axis splits and you get twins. Uh -huh. And we know that one out of 70 babies is a twin. Every twin that is monozygotic, meaning coming from one egg, is a malformation. It's an anomaly. Oh. Normally, we are not two. Normally, we are one. And sometimes the split is incomplete, so they remain stuck. And so that's what pagus means. Pagus means stuck in Greek. So they get stuck chest to chest or belly to belly or head to head. And they live what is called forever together, if they live. So that's what we get. The characteristic of these anomalies, if they survive, is they don't have mental retardation and many other things that are so common among other congenital malformed babies. If they survive, the brain will develop. 
because the potential of development of the rest of the organism remains intact. This is interference, not abnormal genes. So the genes of whatever else goes on are capable of normal development. You know, five fingers here, five there. Both twins, and as you know, many Siamese twins are intelligent and <clears throat> articulate. Now, a little bit down the line, if you now have one axis and you want to be become a human being, this little flat plate, like a saucer, has to make a tube. Because everything in biology, we are all a bunch of tubes. So it begins to fold and has an opening on the top and one opening at the bottom, and this is the top of the tube, will be the head, and the bottom tube will be the end of the spinal cord, and all in between is that neural axis, head, and spine. If that tube does not close, you get opening. So on the top, you will miss the head, so that's called anencephaly. A little bit further down, doesn't close, it's like a zipper, doesn't zip, you will have a spina bifida or open spine. And then there are all kinds of technical terms to distinguish variabilities of these. Now, on the other hand, if you have the other side forward, if it doesn't close, your belly doesn't close, so at least it's an umbilical hernia, very common around the umbilical cord. A bigger one is called a phallocele, or you know, an opening in the front. Omphalon is, is actually a belly button, and so on. So you have what's called body wall defect. In fact, the non-closure of the neural tube and the non-closure of the belly or abdomen are correlated. That is, the risk of having both is far greater for those who have one or the other. Oh, fancy. Than somebody who would have only one or the other. So we have that too. We have about 15% uh, of babies, if they have one, they have the other as well. Now, <clears throat> if you have that non-closure a little bit higher, the heart, the heart is outside of the chest. And it will be beating uh, unprotected. And some babies, perfectly normal, intelligent babies going to school, happen to have this very serious congenital malformation of an open chest with the heart palpating there. So we know that the brain is spared, so the genes are normal because you cannot have a normal brain and a normal intelligence unless virtually all your genes are working. Mm. The machinery of the brain is so complicated that if you have a genetic imbalance, your chances to have normal intelligence are close to nil. So you can almost say that babies with serious congenital malformations who have normal intelligence are not due to genetic mutation. For example, spina bifida. You have a lot of intelligent people in, in wheelchairs, paralyzed, that there is nothing wrong with their intellect. And to postulate that these anomalies are due to genes is silly. But they are due to something. Um, except that your postulate that they've got normal genes, I don't quite understand because children with cystic fibrosis have two abnormal genes and they've got normal intelligence or children with diabetes or children with... But those are not teratogenic. Genes. No, they're not teratogenic, yes, yes. Well, would now, you... There are genes that cause malformations, of course. Mm. Cleft lip and palate is an example. Okay. So we know that cleft lip and palate is more common in families. We know it's more common in certain ethnic groups. But we also know there are drugs that cause cleft lip and palate. Mm. And so, so life is not a one explanation fit all. Yes. Nor one anomaly has one explanation. But all the evidence in this region, the northern region of where we study, shows that the anomalies are not due to alcohol. Radiation is everywhere, so why should we seek 
causes somewhere, you know, in, in New Zealand. Of course. Yeah, well, right in front of our nose, a major cause of congenital malformation called radiation. Yeah. So obviously we're going to focus on that. And the way you do this is, for instance, we measure head size. Every baby born has a head measurement. This is routine medicine. And the head measurement should be within standards. And we find that in some areas it's below standards. So these are called subclinical impacts. Those babies have not microcephaly or carefully because those heads are not that small but they are smaller. And similar effects have been noticed in Sweden and in Norway, in, in the, only in the areas impacted by Chernobyl mm. about 20 years ago. And their so, IQs are lower. Exactly. So, you know, microcephaly is an anomaly late. It, uh, it is far further down the development uh, time timeline, and that's why if you impact the brain, you impact the intelligence. Would but you, you like have to, to have a brain. Mm -hmm. Yes. Would you like to describe what a teratoma is, what a microphthalmia is, and anophthalmia to the audience, please? Okay, sure. Sure. Well, the brain is, a, is, as I said, first there is a tube, and then the tube closes. It becomes a balloon. Uh with a communication going downward toward the spine. So this balloon, uh, you know, then splits into two balloons and we have the right brain and the left brain. Now, from that balloon puts us out, or there is a second balloon that comes out and that's the eye. The eye really is an extension of the brain. That's why the retina, the, the, the visual aspect of the eye uh, is nervous tissue. Now, if you have microcephaly, you are more likely to have microphthalmia. Those two are very often uh, a package. So you have to study both at the same time, and we see uh, statistically significant higher rates of both, of microphthalmia and microcephaly. But those are later teratogenic effects than, let's say, uh, the conjoint twin. Now, the other anomaly, teratoma, we have to backtrack to that axis. If you have an axis and you make two, you have twins. If they don't separate, you have conjoint twins. But if they don't separate and one becomes degenerate, incorporated, altered, he begins to look like a lump. And instead of dying, he is parasitizing uh, the normal organism. And so these children are born with a tumor. We call it a tumor, which is nothing but a lump. And in that lump, there is every tissue of, of the human organism. You find teeth and hair and fingers or whatever have you, but it's completely deranged. And those are called teratomas or, or, or monster-like uh, non uh, or monster-like things that didn't become, uh, they, they don't look like a human, okay? That's what a teratoma is. And they are usually located in the sacrum area, lumbosacral area, or the coccyx, and so on and so on. So obviously that is of interest to us because it may be a package. You have twins on one side, conjoined twins, and then... Uh, a, a different degree of the same thing called teratoma. Mm. So now you've produced this paper. There's statistical evidence that the food is very radioactive in this area. And in fact, you say that one mushroom eaten in the affected area may deliver as much radiation as hundreds of chest X-rays. Or more. Uh, well, one one mushroom has as much radioactivity as, let's say, four or five pounds of wood. Uh, different organisms, different trees, uh, different nutrients are different products. They are products of life. And each plant 
does its own way uh, different things. And so each plant incorporates radiation differently. That's the first point. Secondly, radiation is not even important in this thing. The important thing is what sort of carrier of the radiation are you dealing with? For instance, all the standards in Fukushima or in Chernobyl are based on cesium. Cesium is a lookalike to salt, to sodium. So therefore, a plant is fooled into thinking that it's absorbing sodium when in reality it's absorbing cesium. So the less salt, the more cesium. In other words, the plant doesn't know the difference. It's a matter of proportion. And once it is in, it distributes uh, like, I'm sorry, I misspoke. It's not cesium, it's potassium. Yes, I so, thought so. <laughs> yes. Right. So the, the point is that in the embryo, it's not going to concentrate in any particular tissue. You know, potassium is everywhere. And potassium half-life in an organism is different than, let's say, uh, uh, chrome or whatever have you. So the biologic half-life, inside of the body, what comes in gets out in about eight months. That they say. But on the other hand, you can, you can integrate uh, the molecule into a structure, let's say like a chromosome, and the chromosome is stable. So once in the chromosome, you go nowhere. You're captive. Now, the problem is that in addition, although officially it is stated that Cesium is the way to go. Uh, we uh, were a little bit skeptical about that, so we decided to measure strontium. We were told there is no strontium, we are wasting money, this is very expensive, it's a complicated test. Nonetheless, we found that there is plenty of strontium. And strontium looks like to the organism as calcium. And as we know, teeth and bones and all that bind calcium because without it you don't have the necessary stiffness in certain parts of the organism. So obviously we have not seen official measures of this particular form of radioactivity. Radioactivity is radioactivity, is energy, something that vibrates. But who is vibrating makes a difference. If the vibrator is a calcium-like, it's going to get into your skeleton and you won't keep it forever. So the effects or the teratogenic effects of cesium against strontium, although the radiation may be exactly the same, it is concentrated in different areas of the body. And therefore, the diapason or the, or, or the range of anomalies you're going to see with one form of radioactivity and another form of radioactivity may be completely different. And this is why radiation dosimetry is a little bit silly. It's dosimetry of what poison, mm. you see. Mm. So, you know, everything is reduced to such simplicity that it no longer makes sense to me. Mm. And yet, we need to show something that black and white that cannot be disputed. Anybody can dispute measurements of radiation. You can always introduce doubt. But a baby that has no head is a baby that has no head. And a baby that is stuck together to another baby, well, you have to be blind not to see it. So what we concentrate on are facts, on visible, indisputable facts. And then we're going to explore potential causes by prospective ways of, of doing studies if we get there. And if we don't do it, somebody might. So I hope somebody will. Did you measure things like americium and plutonium and the alpha emitters in that area, Dr. Wertelecki? Well, <laughs> you see, most states, including Ukraine, are very leery to uh, allow foreigners like me to um, uh, engage in this sort of measurements that may contradict official policies. 
And to do these measurements, uh, it is politic to do them in the country rather than do them in a export way like many people do. Uh, we have to be good citizens there because everybody who does the work does it and works and is a part of official uh, health teams that essentially have no business in the radiation uh, area. To measure these uh, forms of energy is very, very technically challenging. And in Ukraine, the technology is concentrated in one sole institute in Kiev. And to measure this sort of thing, they have, you know, in transit they change and so on. So it's a major do. We are going to measure only what is essential to measure. And at this point, I think strontium is the number one candidate. Mm. Plutonium was not a likely, uh, let's say, carrier of radioactivity in those areas, but it wouldn't hurt to know for sure. Yes. Uh, strontium is something that the United States measured consistently uh, in order to uh, determine the impact of open-air atomic bomb testing. So every time they had a, a, an explosion in Nevada, the wind would carry that toward the East Coast or New York and so on. So they were measuring not cesium, they were measuring strontium. And this was one of the reasons why I said, well, why, why aren't we measuring strontium? We did it for so many years. We measured it in milk and so on. But strontium is difficult to measure. It sort of requires some cooking and extractions and and a totally more complicated way. And cesium is practical. You just have a, an energy counter and, and push a button and read what, how many beeps you get from the energy, and that's it. Uh, and for strontium, it's much more expensive. You have to have reagents. You have to have very special equipment and so on. So you have to be economic to how far you go. I see. So from the data that you have um, compiled, could you extrapolate to the situation in Fukushima and prognosticate what might happen there, Dr. Wotelecki? Well, no, I couldn't, uh, but except just like you, uh, I read what people report. I have no personal involvement of any sort. I, I did give lectures in Tokyo and uh, Kyoto recently, and I met people from a variety of universities that attended these events. Uh, my sense is that the path followed in Japan closely resembles the path that evolved uh, after Chernobyl. And there are more regrettables than non-regrettables in, in that path. It seems like, uh, uh, like, frankly, it's difficult to understand what's going on and what's not going on. From my point of view, the priority, absolute priority, are women of reproductive age. Because whatever befells them will befell their children. And that's the prime principle of prevention. A healthy mother will have a healthy baby. Uh, they have no registry of pregnant women, as far as I know. They could have obtained that at the time of the accident. Uh, but I, as far as I know, even today, there is very little emphasis on these aspects. Everything is concentrated on cancer risk and on adults. Children, for some reason, except for the thyroid, uh, because of this, let's say, scandalous epidemic of thyroid cancer in Ukraine, which is could have been prevented to a very large extent. Uh, that's the only uh, child-oriented emphasis. The rest is all on cancer of adults. So 
the, uh, the lessons unlearned in Japan is is children beyond the scope of iodine and thyroid cancer are very important. Of course, so are the genes in the sperm and men's testicles. <laughs> uh, you know, when they're young and before they've reached adolescence and after adolescence, and I think often we ignore that as well, do we not? Well, there are, you know, like everything else, uh, Mendelian genetics, which is the traditional genetics gene mutation chromosome, that apparently is challenged. Radiation, according to the new uh, pioneers, um, is a source of what's called hereditary genomic instability. Mm -hmm. And that is a very disquieting proposition. What it implies is that you can destabilize the genome independently of the DNA. And if you destabilize the genome, the consequences are entirely unpredictable. Genes have predictable, you know, outcomes. But unstable genes at any time, anywhere, anyhow, and uh, you can't predict what the end product will be. So, therefore, you see, looking just at one mutation, cystic fibrosis or achondroplasia, is not the current concern. The current concern is instability. And if you have instability, you cannot become a baby or you cannot stay away from cancer. Can you explain the ge genetic, hereditary genetic instability in more detail, please, so people can understand what you're talking about, Dr. Wesley? Well, I don't think people can understand because the scientists don't understand. <laughs> so, therefore, there are no explanations other than, again, facts. It's unexplained facts. No theory to explain them. No, 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 no basis. Well, what to, are the facts? Uh, what are the facts that they say? Well, the facts are this, that, that if you have genomic instability, a cell does not make a like cell. It will make something more or less like, but not exactly the same. You cannot make a tissue because instead of having a uniform population of cells that cooperate with each other, you will have rogue cells here and there that do the same. So instead of an organism, you have a disorganism or a disorganized tissue or a disorganized uh, organ. And so this kind of disorganization, which in a way is our aging process and, and our cancer process and so on, has um, unpredictable consequences. Now, the evidence for that is entirely uh, from non-human uh, source. And, uh, of course, our serious uh, instability we'd never hear of is the sperm that never fertilizes, is the egg who never becomes uh, fertilized, is the fertilized egg who never implants or is the implant who never grows. So in other words, the attrition, what is called theranthanasia, and that is the, the, the death before birth, uh, sweeps this away. And what you end up having is perhaps perceptible or perhaps not reduction of reproductive fitness. In terms of the born, genomic instability, will create sterility or infertility because we need to produce a very complicated thing called the sperm. The, uh, or instability in the sense that you will have a change of rates of, let's say, degenerative diseases like arthritis or this or that or the other. So this is, a, this is a very important emerging issue to know how to measure genomic instability. And they are doing a great job. In, in approaching this question uh, through the study of cells in vitro, in other words, in, outside of the organism. Mm. Now, mm -hmm. we have a whole host of non-human organisms, 
and birds and butterflies, which in Fukushima they say have mutated. There is a team of uh, experts on birds and ornithology from France, uh, very distinguished Danish ornithologist who says who found in Ch in Chernobyl area very very major disturbing findings that exactly the same is happening in Fukushima. In other words, the these birds, for instance, cannot uh, migrate because they become exhausted and they don't come back, uh, and so on and so on. They find microcephaly, just like we do. They, they find uh, all kinds of instability, like random uh, spotted changes of fur, which are local mutations, of course, and so on and so on. Yes, and crooked wings and abnormal tail feathers, and also many of the male birds have looked at, the, the swallows, barn swallows, are sterile. Right. Well, you see, that's a chapter of what's called planar uh, embryology or planar development. Plan is like the scale of a snake. They, you can pass your hand along one way and not lift those scales, and then the opposite way they are all going to stand up. The same with the hair. You can pet, pet an animal along the slant of the hair or against it. That is a program, and this planar way gets disturbed. So you have worlds in the wrong place, like some children with microcephaly will have worlds in the wrong spot. And there'll be a world in the middle of the head or on the side, and we're accustomed to see only one in the upper posterior top of the head and so on. So there are all kinds of indicators of, of instability, among others, asymmetry. In other words, left and right are not identical twins, but they are very asymmetric, and so on and so on. It's a, it's a, there are many ways to look at, at these questions, but uh, only <laughs> a limited lifespan and, and resources. And what about uh, the disproportion when a, a population is irradiated, there are fewer females born than predicted. Normally many more females are born than males in the human population, but in an irradiated population that proportion changes. Is that true? Well, of course. Well, uh, I don't know if it's true. Uh, I... Uh, uh, okay. It's called the male-female ratio. Normally it's 1.07. That is, there is 0 0.7 or 7% more females uh, than males at birth. That proportion, as you go backwards, changes. Uh, and um, nobody knows the proportion at conception. Then there are dogmas that say you lose more boys, so slowly the proportion of girls increases. Well, we know boys' mortality is way higher than the females. One of the, let's say, curiosities is stuttering. The stuttering has one of the strongest male-female disproportion. Boys stutter. If you find a girl that stutters, let me know. Mm. Okay, now that is a sign of, let's say, disharmony, okay, or the inability to integrate. But in any event, we study uh, male-female proportion very much, and the female preponderance is dramatic in among the neural tube defects, more in anencephaly than spina bifida. So the more you go toward the head, the more females, mm -hmm. which may mean more males disappear. Mm. Second, we have more females with microcephaly. Nobody in the literature knows the proportion of male-female. I don't know why, uh, but uh, it's not in the literature. Maybe that's new or maybe that's everywhere, but I cannot find uh, supporting evidence anywhere else. But there it is. We have more females, just like neural tube defects. Mm. And there are virtually only females with conjoined twins. Oh, that's interesting. 
And then there are virtually only females with teratoma. That's interesting too. Right. So we have an independent track saying these things have something in common. And one of those things in common is female prevalence. And that is pointing out to perhaps one common mechanism. If not the cause, maybe the mechanism. Mm. And this is how epidemiology works. Now, in contrast, there is a sharp predominance of males that have the omphalocele, the open belly. Mm. Not so if they also have an open spine. If they have an open belly and spine, there is prevalence of females again. Mm. Now, you know, there are two X chromosomes in females. Boys have one. When you inhibit that one X chromosome, in order so the female would be like a boy, so they are balanced, that is when the axis is laid for the body. Mm. So abnormal inhibition of one X chromosome or delayed inhibition of one X chromosome may be actually the cause for training. Mm and therefore of conjoined twins, and therefore of teratomas. How fascinating. And, there are many, and, and, and the X chromosome is so much larger than the Y, it piles up mutation. And having two, it doubles the dose. So it doesn't not only oh. pile up mutations, but twice as many mutations. Oh. And therefore that may make the female brittle. But the facts are not there. So we have a choice, genetic theory or medical facts. Yes. And we choose medical facts. This has been absolutely fascinating, and it takes me back to my first year in medical school in 1956 when we had uh, an embryology lecture called um, Dudley Packer. We used to call him Cuddly Dudley. And he used to lean on the blackboard and draw the embryo and the divisions and the neural tubes and etc etc and I'm reminded as we talk about my first introduction to embryology but your the discussion today has been absolutely fascinating and it has huge implications upon the uh, the nuclear regulatory commission and the ICRP and the and all the other the IAEA all of these huge United Nations organizations which determine how much radiation the human being can receive and none of this information or data is taken into their extrapolations and their standards that they set, is it? Well, there is not much data. You see, one of the nice things is to be able to say, well, uh, here is somebody did this, that or the other, and it is very difficult to say nicely and convincingly, nobody did that. Mm. And it's obvious mm. that it should have been done. Yeah. We started doing this in the year 2000. The accident of, of Chernobyl was in 1986, yeah. it's 14 years yeah. later. Mm. You know, things ought to start before the accident. Yes. So congenital malformation monitoring is a security blanket for all societies. Mm. For instance, we had here the the BP disaster. It's a horrible disaster. But the most common source of radiation in society is not uh, the pollution of nuclear power plants. It is coal-burning power plants. We, When we dig up Mother Earth and dig up her entrails, and bring it up to the surface. We don't bring coal, we bring everything else with it. Mercury, mainly, and radioactivity. When the power plant ends up burning that coal, not only does it pollute the air, but the, and with mercury included, but also there is radioactivity in it. And one of the most radioactive dumping waste is that ash. Well, oil is the same thing. There is no oil without some mercury and some radioactivity. So we had 
enormous quantities of oil spilled up that is picked up by organisms and recycled and concentrated and each one who eats one the eats one eats one eats one and each one that eats concentrates more and more and more and more until the pregnant woman decides to have a good dinner on some kind of a marine product. Yes. So if we are interested if BP has consequences to the unborn, and we don't have a congenital malformation system in place, we don't have a baseline. Mm. So we don't know if what we see today is 10 times bigger or not changed or even less. We have no idea where we sit at. We have no reference point. Mm, because we're not and each standing. society has birth certificates. And why not to make out of the birth certificate something valuable? Because right now it's worthless. Well, Dr. Wertelecki, we've reached the end of our time. You're a pioneer in medicine, and I so much appreciate the interview today. And I hope the audience take it all in and digest it and understand what you've been saying from a medical Well, tell the audience to send me a line. Yes. Okay. My guest today on If You Love This Planet was Vladimir Wertelecki, the founder and chairman of the Department of Medical Genetics and Birth Defect Center at the University of South Alabama in the U.S. and secretary treasurer of the World Alliance for the Prevention of Birth Defects. I thank you so much for listening today. Look, I know it was a little complicated, but I want you to listen and listen again. Take in these facts absorb them, digest them, understand what we were saying as doctors so that you will understand what radiation, um, nuclear power and all the rest means to us and future generations. You can go to the website if you love this planet.org and download this um, program if you've just caught it on the radio and listen again and get all your friends to listen. Um, if you'd like to contribute to the programs, we'd be very grateful. There's a donate button on the website. And we'll be back with you again next week for another wonderful program. Bye for now.